A fairy book land of mists and veils, guarded by imposing castles, embodied by the crown. This tiny island that once ruled the world has had a complex relationship with India. The Indian diaspora that makes an enormous contribution to Britain. Indians are extremely good business people. There's 10,000 businesses here in London run by people from within the Indian community and many of those businesses are very large businesses. The diaspora that have come from India into the United Kingdom have made a huge difference to this country. Quite literally, they've built cities. In sports, in business, in art, you name it, Indians are reaching the very top. Keeping these historic relations going are Britain's Indians. Their colors shimmer through the land. Their flavors spice every aspect of life in this country that's become home. These people that have become family. As London sheds slumberous sleep and raises its face to an eastern dawn, Billingsgate Market repeats centuries-old rhythms as it bustles to feed the city. They're very much an integral part of the city and, of course, um, they also provide Londoners with their, their favourite source of food, which of course is the Indian restaurant, and, um, and there's a lot of those in London. And playing his part in what was once the largest fish market in the world is Atul Kocha, the first Indian chef to receive the coveted Michelin star. Morning, gentlemen. How are you? Good to see you. After picking his ingredients, he heads towards his restaurant, Benares, to prepare a lip-smacking meal. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have beautiful John Dory, which we'll be prepare, prepping today. So I want you guys to just help me through the process. Let's kick it. Today, he's cooking his version of a legendary British dish, fish and mushy peas. I love British mushy peas and I love mushy peas from India, which is from Banaras actually. They call it Nimona. I have done the same flavor. And the Britishness comes from by adding a little bit of cream while um, crushing it so that it just gives a nice smooth blend. And it goes well with my fish. The tomato looks amazing. It's a very British plate with Indian flavor. One of the biggest aspects of India that is a daily part of British life is Indian food. Uh, Britain is a nation of curryholics. Doing more to encourage this craze for Indian curry is noted chef and author Monisha Bhardwaj. I started my own cooking school about eight years ago. It's called Cooking with Monisha. And this was in response to the fact that more and more people are now wanting to cook Indian food at home. The camaraderie of home cooking builds bonds and encourages students from every background to come and savor spices they've never seen, flavors they've only dreamed. Do you want a curry that is very spicy or very medium? Very spicy. Well, no, we'll, we'll have to take average for me. What would you like? Me spicy. Very? I don't know. Yeah. On a scale of 1 to 10? 10. No, maybe not. <laughs> Simple home cooking is Monisha's mantra. Once the right instructions are given, it's time for her students to take center stage. Beyond building empires, the diaspora has developed a talent for giving back. Perhaps the best known and most widely appreciated of all British Indian philanthropy efforts is Lord Swaraj Paul's contribution to saving London's iconic zoo. It was a good 20 years or so that he made a very large donation for our children's zoo 
and he asked for it to be in memory of his, his daughter Ambika. It was an important time because the zoo was having a tough time financially and Lord Paul's very generous support at that time really helped a large part of the zoo move forward, develop and become a wonderful feature for families ever since then. A place where Lord Paul sees the same joy and laughter that he once saw in Ambika, who loved to come here as a respite between grueling bouts of cancer. In 1966, my daughter fell ill and uh, the, we brought her for treatment. We were here for 22 months looking after her. And then unfortunately we lost her. Zoo has become a very sentimental place from my point of view. Because I do this thing, I have dedicated my business to Ambika. I mean, I think she's just a guiding hand. A popular landing place in England is Leicester, a city that boasts the UK's highest ethnic diversity. And representing this multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic New Britannia is Keith Vaz. This is the centre of the Asian community in Britain. Hello, ladies. Are you lost? Where are you from? Nottingham. Nottingham. You see, there are people from all over the country. They've even come from Nottingham to Leicester. I'm Keith Vaz. I'm the MP for Leicester. The country's longest serving Asian MP, Keith, is frequently named among Britain's most influential Asians. I think the Indian community has achieved so much in a very short space of time because one, this is a culture that is strong and productive. Secondly, because they've been dedicated, hardworking, they've not relied on benefits. And since we recently discovered that Prince William may well have Indian blood in him through a previous uh, ancestor, I think that's going to help enormously. I always thought he was a cousin of mine and now I know he is. Cousins or not, the Brotherhood goes back to the World Wars. But our men did a very good job. They weren't just cannon fodder. Uh, in the Second World War, as I said, they were crucial. So I think London is the place where they should be remembered. The size particularly of the contingents from countries like India, which exceeded a million, are, are just breathtaking, really. We did come and stand by them when they most needed our help. And why do you think people have come here? Why do you think the immigration started? It started because of the war. With an economy devastated by war, suffering the loss of a significant proportion of its population, Britain appealed to men and women from across the empire to come rebuild factories, restart industry, and reignite the economy. Britain actively encouraged migration to Britain to recruit um, doctors and nurses for the newly founded NHS, which happened in 1948. And their success helped build the path to migration for the next wave of Indian immigrants who came here via Africa. The real change took place when the East African Indians came. Uh, they went into small businesses uh, and then the children went to professions. The sorts of businesses that Indian businesses have been have been, you know, in many cases, traditional businesses, uh, import, export, and, and, and shops. Uh, and I think that has grown into, into something bigger. Economic success helped pave the path to social acceptance, changing the way Indians were viewed by the British. But equally important to the diaspora's integration was becoming part of the mosaic of cultures that is modern Britain. What inspires us to combine the two cultures is the experience we had as young art students, whereby the fact that we were inspired by the Indian miniature painting as a personal form of expression was not really accepted because it wasn't seen as something that was valid, and I think that really fired us up to prove them otherwise. There is a lot of cultural identity that has been cross-reference, whether it be through language or fashion or whatever. We've got, you know, kind of Bollywood really making an impact on British life and culture and Indian food making such an impact. Mm. So I think the Western audience actually can relate to the fact that our work is bringing together this multicultural eclecticism. 
similar conversations between East and West take place in a world of cuisine where Lord Billy Moria designed a quintessentially British product. Yeah, to go with the spicy curries beloved of Britain. And of course, a lot of Indians will consume Cobra Beer with pride as a brand from India that is now a household name in the UK and one of the fastest growing beer brands in Britain. Like beer, another British pursuit that's become an Indian passion is cricket. Indian origin players are a vital part of British cricket, with the Chennai born Nasir Hussain even captaining the national team. We Indians, we howl and shout and we enjoy the cricket, but what have we done for the British cricket? Lord Noon, a cricket enthusiast, convinced a host of his fellow businessmen to rally around the creation of an India room at London's famous Surrey Cricket Ground. We were very lucky to have a group of Indian businessmen based in London who helped part fund the, the OCS stand and as such we have an India room which is very important to us. The, the, it's one of our prime hospitality areas. Even as Lord Noon enjoys his afternoon of cricket, his vision goes much beyond the ground as he dares to dream of a Britain where everyone has the same opportunities to succeed that he did, avoids the mistakes he made, and so he's endowed the Noon Educational Centre at the University of East London. When you earn in a country like this, give it back. I'm not a multi-millionaire, but whatever I could, I have done it and I'm very happy about it. What we wanted to do with the Noon Center and, and the contribution that Lord Noon has really made to our uh, business school is by really celebrating diversity in terms of working with employers to help them realize that actually it's great business, not just good business, to have a diverse uh, workforce. In the land of Oxford and Cambridge, education has always been a favored preoccupation shaping the ideas and ideals of Indians from the leaders of the freedom struggle onwards. It's little wonder that many of the diaspora's philanthropic efforts revolve around increasing access to Britain's world-class universities. We focus more on some traditional subjects like law, economics, pure science, um, philosophy, literature, but we then moved into the arts because there was very little funding for the arts. And we don't just focus on Oxford. Um, we've been sending people to Oxford and Cambridge and Imperial and so as. Education has various forms. And here, in the beautiful and quaint city of Nottingham, education in traditional Indian music has come down from two generations to the very talented singer, Santu. From grandfather to father and father to son, the music of the Gurbani morphed into the rhythm of rock. But the songs Santu sings still include the ones his father wrote for him. He's very switched on, I must say that, you know, he's, he's blessed in such a way that, um, that there's not a lot, but he's, he's a great follower, he's a great listener, you know, and then he just absolutely interprets it exactly the way he wants it to be. Sunrise Radio, 1458, कौन सा गाना आप सनराइज पर मिक्स एंड मैच होता है हिंदी भी होता है पंजाबी भी होता है ताकि वो अपने गुजरात को या पंजाब को अपनी मिट्टी को याद कर सके और कभी ना भूल पाए
far-sighted media entrepreneur Dr. Aftar Litt didn't become a voice for justice community, but a beacon for Britain's many minority. Sunrise was actually the world's first independent commercial radio station. It was very important, not just from the cultural and the musical side, but this public policy input was very, very important. As Sunrise Radio caters to diaspora audience, a band from the vibrant and culturally diverse city of Birmingham called Swami is breaking out to a larger audience. We are on Soho Road in Birmingham, which is the closest you can get to inside of England to being back in India. Following in the footsteps of bands like UB40 that fuse musical traditions from Birmingham's different ethnic groups, Swami explores issues of identity through their music. We're bringing these ideas of fusion together in a new way, in a pop way, in a, in a way in which it truly represents us growing up as Indian people, but being very much British at the same time. Ready? One, two. race so I'm half Punjabi and I'm half English. So I grew up very kind of conflicted in a sense about what my identity was and doing the music that we do it allows me to kind of feel complete and that I'm not just focusing on one half of my ethnic heritage or the other I get to do both. Britain and India are building on bonds of not just culture and art, but through the energy of the diaspora they share, they're moving beyond the painful past to forge rock-solid relationships in business and politics. The links between India and the UK go back many, many centuries, and that's why we have a natural empathy with one another. The way that India is having to come up with very, very creative ideas around its economic balance. That creativity is being applied and other places can learn from it, including the UK. I think Indians are comfortable here and I think it works both ways. Um, it, it's a very easy relationship. There is so much shared history. Uh, I didn't have to learn anything when I came here. I almost knew everything about life here. There was a time where we used to use these words like mixed race and half caste where you're half Indian and you're half this or you're half... Why can't you be fully both? Why can't I be fully English and fully Indian? When Britain is playing, I'm with England. But if India is playing against any team, I will howl and shout for India. I'm very proud to be a Zoroastrian Farsi. I'm very proud to be British. I'm very proud to be an Asian, an Indian in Britain. And I think that having that pride in one's roots and being close to your roots is very important, but also to integrate in the community in which you're living in. The diaspora's contributions to the United Kingdom have been legion. Building lives in a new land, they help bring two cultures together, two countries closer, and make two people one.
There is no longer this idea that Britishness is necessarily white British. Mm -hmm. Britishness is made up of all sorts of cultures, including the Asian culture. India's vibrancy has changed the UK, and that's all to the good. There's one music I really love, and that's... Should I sing it? Thumb past the high, you must cry. Thumb in a jani kya, sabune di kai. Apuro miradil, jani ya chota hai. Bia kar hai, kuchu kuchu hota hai.